it's all good. Hallelujah. That it's all God. Hallelujah. If I was just anybody, I'd say it's all good, but I know that it's all God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Pastor played that song this morning. And I have a confession. I wasn't on time for 8 o'clock service. So I caught it in the car. Amen. And I sent a message over to he and our uh, lead up there, the bossy one up there. I sent a message to them and, and asked them if that could be my song of preparation. Because as I was listening on the drive-in, and I, and I thought about, and this is my Pentecostal coming out, so y'all, hallelujah. Welcome to Vancouver Avenue First Pentecostal Baptist Church. <laughs> Amen, but as I, as I drove in, and, and that song played, and, and, I, and I, thank you, Jesus, and I thought about my life and the things that God had brought me through and, the th and, and, and delivered me from, delivered me from myself and delivered me from people, amen, delivered me from circumstances, amen, Hi, delivered me from a mind that was set on doing evil, amen. God delivered me, and I, and, I, and I thought about it, you know, because we have a choice to make a decision for Christ. Hallelujah, and I made that decision, but if I didn't know who God was, I would say that it was me, and it's all good. I did that, but it wasn't me, it was God, so hallelujah, hallelujah, it's all God, amen. Thank you, Jesus, and I'm excited today about God. Y'all may be seated, because hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. I'm just, right now, just thinking about the goodness of God. Thank you. Yes, God, and pastor already, amen, in truth. Introduced uh, my family. Y'all seen my cousin Cynthia and Uncle Mark a lot. And today I have uh, my daughter, my youngest daughter. Amen. I call her Mutter, but she goes by Kelly. Amen. <laughs> so she's here, and I have my uh, oldest granddaughter, Ashton. Hey, Ashton. <laughs> and uh, my youngest um, grandson, who's eight months. Um, Jalen, amen, Jalon, Jalen, amen, right in there. And then I have my baby brother, Rod, that's my baby brother right there, amen. <laughs> and, and, and then next to him is a special woman, she's his mother, amen, but she received me in as her own and she's never treated me any different than she treats him. And she's done the same thing for my children and grandchildren as well. So they know her as Grandma Tammy. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Y'all ready? Amen. Praise God. I'm going to pray before I read scripture. Amen. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I come this morning just asking you, oh God, to rest in me, oh God. I ask that you would calm every ounce of nerves, oh God, that is within me as I preach your word, the word that you've given me for this day and this time. I ask, Father, that you stand up and that I sit down and that the word that you've given me will reach the ears that it needs to reach, oh God, that you would root up, that you would tear up and tear down, pull up and plow out, whatever it is, oh God, Lord, don't let us leave the same way that we came in, but let your word be alive in us 
O oh God, and let us use it for your glory. In your precious son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And we are going to get into the word, and you may continue to stay seated. We're going to go into Esther, the fifth chapter, the ninth, and 10a, so just the first part of 10. And it reads, coming from the NIV, Esther 5, 9, 10a, it reads, Haman went out that day happy and in high spirits. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Amen. Haman restrained himself and went home. And I'd also like to give honor to our pastor, a man who doesn't have to share the pulpit, but he does. Amen. And he works with us to get us, to help us to be better, that we might rightly divide the word of God. Amen. Amen. So today we find ourselves smack dab in the middle of a conspiracy. And I know some of you may think that I'm talking about the controversial conspiracy theories surrounding the 2020 election or that of whether COVID is actually real or not and if masks are needed. One of the greatest conspiracy theories is whether the earth is flat or round and I can help with that to debunk that theory in Isaiah 40 and 22, 40 and 22, it says that God sits on his throne above the circle of the earth. Amen. So you see, people have been conspiring for a long time. This just didn't happen. Now, in order for there to be a conspiracy, there has to be someone or some ones that are conspiring meaning there has to be someone that is working to bring about a particular event, result, or outcome that is typically to the detriment of someone else. Today, we're talking about a conspiracy, and not only are we talking about a conspiracy, we're talking about a human conspirator, an evil conspirator, and a divine conspirator. Thus, the title of my sermon, A Divine Conspirator. That's who we want to focus on today. How many of you know that there's a difference between a human conspirator and a divine conspirator? The Bible makes it plain what an evil conspirator is. An evil conspirator is like a roaring lion who seeks to devour. An evil conspirator comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The evil conspirator is always working against the divine conspirator, but the evil conspirator needs a human conspirator to carry out his plans. Amen. How many of you know that a spirit cannot operate on the earth without a body? That's a sermon for another day. In contrast, the divine conspirator wants us to have life and that more abundantly. The divine conspirator has a plan for our lives and will strategically set us up for victory. The divine conspirator will turn what the human conspirator meant for bad into good. There are several co human conspirators in the book of Esther, and you all will have to go back and read it yourself, but there are. The one that I want to focus on today is Haman. The book of Esther is the only book in the Bible that does not mention God by name. However, we can see the actions of God all throughout the book. So let's back up just a little bit so that I can bring us up to speed with where we're at in the passage of Scripture. Many of us may already know uh, the story of Esther, and if that's you, it's okay. Just roll with me. We're going to go ahead and walk through it anyway. Amen? The story of Esther begins with a grand banquet, and the, ki the, the, the king, uh, King Xerxes, is having this banquet, and everybody's having fun, and you know, the singer just talked about the festival and how, you know, people were partying. So they were partying, right? And the king became a little drunk, as that'll happen if you're drinking, amen? And so he went over a little bit, and he called for the queen, Queen Vashti. She, you know, he thought she was beautiful, and sometimes men 
you know, they want to show off their ladies, amen. So he decided that he was going to call Vashti out. You know, he's drunk, send for Queen Vashti, have her come out and parade herself in front of all these men. Well, Queen Vashti decided that she was going to refuse, and this made the king angry. And uh, he probably thought she was being a little disrespectful by ignoring his request for her to come out because, after all, he was the king. And so because of that, he decided that he was going to divorce her. And uh, you know how people are. They get in your business, and they say, hey, well, king, it's not good for you to be alone. So he decided that he was going to go and find himself another queen. So he began the search for a new queen. And then there was this Jewish girl named Esther, Esther excuse me, who the book is written after. And she was raised by her cousin Mordecai. And um, somehow she got herself into that lineup of young virgins that were basically applying to be the queen. And so um, she got herself lined up and Mordecai told her, you know, don't say that you're a Jew. Just go on in and and go through the process, Go, go through the treatments, amen. And she was attractive and beautiful and she found favor with, um, I believe his name is Haggai. He's the Enoch of the king. She found favor with him, and so he gave her little tips on what to do to to snag the king. And when when it was her time and she went in before the king, amen, he thought that she was the most beautiful and most attractive woman that he had ever seen. And so he placed a crown on her head. And her cousin Mordecai, uh, he used to sit at the gate. Uh, the king's gate. And so the Mordecai was at the king's gate one day and he overheard two of the guards plotting to kill the king. Amen. And he decided that, you know, Esther had got in good. So he's going to warn her that her husband, they're plotting to kill her husband. And so he tells Esther uh, what happens. And Esther tells the queen, uh, excuse me, the king, and then it gets all checked out and, and it lines up. Amen. And so they write that in the history books that Mordecai told Esther, Esther told the king, this is good hearsay. This is good gossip. Amen. And and, and it's written in the book. Amen. (laughs) There is good gossip. It's written in the book, but the two men that, the guards that, that, that planned it, they, um, they were killed. And so now we get to the point where this plot thickens, where Mordecai is, gets in his feelings. Amen. Mordecai has, has come by the king's gates uh, many times, and Mordecai in the past hadn't seen that, um, excuse me, Haman, thank you, God. Haman had uh, went by the, the king's uh, gates a uh, few times, and he didn't notice that Mordecai didn't stand for him. You see, Haman was second in line to the king, amen, and he didn't notice that Mordecai had done that. But, you know, people can be messy, right? So the guards tell uh they tell Haman, you know, Mordecai doesn't doesn't stand when you come by, and he doesn't bow before you when you come by. So the next time that he went by, he saw that Mordecai didn't do this stand for him, and he became in, infuriated, amen. He became so enraged that he wanted to kill Mordecai, and not only did he want to kill Mordecai, but he wanted to kill all of the Jews as well. And somehow he went to the king and he convinced the king to also agree to kill all of the Jews. Mordecai went in. Now, I said that uh, Haman, Lord help me Jesus, Haman went in, amen, to the king and convinced him that all of the Jews weren't standing for him, so they were opposed to his rules, which was not the truth. Mordecai was the only one that didn't bow. Everybody else bowed, but the king agreed, and they they set this date, and again, here's Mordecai sitting at the gates, and he hears the story about Haman wanting to kill all the Jews, so he decides that he's going to again tell Esther, but Esther held it this time. She didn't tell the the king at this time what was going to happened to her and uh, her and all of the Jews and she was fearful for her life and she decided that she was just not going to say anything and Mordecai said to her you know don't think that you and your your father and are going to be safe because you're in the palace amen you will die and someone else will rise up amen hallelujah help will arise from somewhere else 
And so this must have weighed on Esther really hard. And so Esther finally, she agreed and she said, okay, well, tell all of the Jews to fast and to pray for three days. And when, after you do that, then I'll go into the king. And you can't just go into the king. Amen. You ha he has to held it, hold out his scepter and, and call you forward. Amen. And so she went in to the king and, 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 and the king allowed her to come forth. I realize that she's the queen, but there's protocol in this. So he allowed her to come in. And so when she came, when she went in, she asked the king, she says, would, would you have a banquet with me? You and Haman, let's, let's have a banquet. And the king said, I'll give you everything up until half of the kingdom. So whatever you want. So Haman and the king went in and they were there. And the king says, well, what is it, Esther, that you want? And Esther thought about this thing for a little while. And she said, maybe I better hold this. And so she held it to herself. She said, you know, I really want you and Haman to come back tomorrow and have a banquet with me. And so that's exactly what happened. And uh, you would think that Haman uh, would have been happy, amen, to be called back the next day for a banquet. But what he saw was Mordecai again, and Mordecai didn't bow before him again. And so he went home and he talked to his wife and his and his friends, amen, I'll call those co-conspirators, amen. He went and talked to them and they said, well, what I think you ought to do is just build, the, build this 75 foot structure, amen. And I think, you know, you ought to go into the king and ask the king to tell the king that you 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 want to hang Mordecai, amen. And, and he did that, he built it up, amen. It was right in his front yard. For, for all to see, and, and he went to the king. Um, he was going to go to the king. Let me back up and slow down. Hallelujah. Hey, amen. But they were conspiring, amen, to kill uh, Mordecai. And that's when the divine conspirator came on the scene. Amen. He, he couldn't sleep. Uh, Elder Brown says that, hallelujah, the king had divine insomnia. Amen. And he couldn't sleep that night, but uh, neither could Haman. So Haman decided that he was going to go to the courts that night and ask the king if it was okay if he hung Mordecai. And as he was entering the gates, the king just had happened to be having a conversation with his servants, a man, about a book that he wanted to read to see if it would, you know, when you read a book, it can sometimes make you, it's boring and it'll make you fall asleep. But God, the divine conspirator, opened the book to where uh, Mordecai had told them about the conspiracy against the king. And so the king was wondering what had been done to honor Mordecai. And at that same time, the king says, who's in the court? And it's late, and you probably think no one is there, amen. But it just so happened that Mordecai was entering the court to ask the question about hanging. Haman was entering the courts, amen, to ask the king about hanging Mordecai. But the king interrupted him. He says, what should be done for a man that the king wants to honor? Uh, to honor? Haman, thinking that it was himself because he was second in line, he says, give him a royal robe that you yourself have already worn. Bring him a royal horse, a man with a crown on its head that you have ridden on, my king. Give the robe and the horse to the one that the uh, one of the king's most important men. Let them put on the that robe on the man and, and lead the horse through the city and have them announce that this is the man that the king wants wants to honor. And when Haman had finished telling the king all of these things that should be done, the king said, hi, great. That's exactly what I want you to do. I want you to go and get Mordecai. I want you to go and put, put my robe on him and get my horse and lead him through the city and tell him, amen, that this is the man that the king wants to honor. And Haman, amen, he was embarrassed and ashamed as he walked home that he covered his head. Amen. You know, he put a hoodie on so couldn't nobody could tell who he was. And when he got home, he did the same thing that he did before. Amen. He talked to the co-conspirators and he talked to his wife. Amen. And they told him, you know, well, I think you might just be losing your power. You might be getting yourself into a little bit of trouble. I'm talking about a divine conspirator here, a man that has set everything up for Mordecai. 
Amen. And so as the, they were telling him what was going on, remember there was this second uh, banquet. Amen. And so uh, they gathered uh, they gathered uh, Haman again and said, come on and go to the banquet. It's time for the sacred banquet. And so Mordecai, with his head down, went on to the banquet. Amen. And, and uh, the king ask uh, the queen once again, what is it that you want? I'm not quite sure. You know, I've, I, I, I couldn't sleep last night because I was wondering what it is that you wanted. And you called Haman. Why does Haman need to come? Amen. And so she said, well, you know, there's this man, amen, this, this evil conspirator, this human conspirator that wants to, amen, kill me and my people. And the king is like, well, who is it? Tell me who it is that wants to take you out, my queen. You know I love you and I do anything for you. Who is it, amen, that wants to take you out? And she says, it's him, it's he. He's the one, hallelujah, Haman, that thing. He's the one that wants to kill me. He's the one that wants to take out all my people, amen. And the king, after he heard it, he became so angry. And you know, sometimes when you get angry, you just gotta take a walk. Amen. So the king got up and he had to take a walk. Amen. And he walked out into the palace garden and he had to gather his thoughts to figure out exactly what he was going to do because someone wanted to, hallelujah, attack his beloved. Amen. And so he composed himself and he came back in. But when he came back in, he saw what he thought was Haman attacking his wife. She was, you know, lounged back on the couch waiting for the king to come back. And so Haman had gone over to her and he was begging and he was pleading and he was down on his knees and he had threw himself across her and he was begging for his life. Please save me. But that's not what the, the king saw. The king saw that he was attacking her. And he said, would you even come in and attack my wife while I'm here? Would you even come in and attack the queen while I'm here? And the, and the king ordered, hallelujah, that Haman be murder, uh, murdered that very day. Hallelujah. On that same 75-foot structure that he had built for Mordecai. Hallelujah. When the divine conspirator, God himself, has a plan and a purpose for us, there is no plan that can be devised that can stop the will of God in our lives. He is unstoppable. Hallelujah. It was no coincidence that Vashti didn't go out when the king called her. It was a divine conspiracy. It was no coincidence that Esther was chosen as queen, even though she was a Jew, or that Mordecai was sitting at the king's gates to receive all that information in. It was a divine conspiracy. It was no coincidence that Mordecai didn't bow before Haman, nor was it a coincidence that Haman plotted to kill Mordecai. Like Esther, both Haman and Mordecai were needed for such a time as that. It was no coincidence that the king had divine insomnia and the record was read about Mordecai. I have to believe that it was no coincidence that Haman just happened to be the only one in the court that night on that sleepless night. The divine conspirator was at work. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. It's, it was, it's no conspiracy. It's no coincidence, excuse me, that you were raised in foster care. It's no coincidence Hallelujah, that you're gone bankrupt. It's no coincidence that your house is foreclosed on. It's no coincidence that you have a wayward child. It's no coincidence, hallelujah, that you've been rejected. The cornerstone was rejected. It's no coincidence. It's a divine setup to get you to where you are today, to get you to where God wants you to go. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And I don't care who conspires against us. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter what child of God the enemy tries to come in and conspire against. Hallelujah. We have a divine conspirator who's at work on our behalf. Hallelujah. We may not be able to see him face to face. Amen. In our Sunday school lesson, we were talking about seeing God face to face. You may not see him face to face. You may just see his back. You may just feel his spirit. It may just be a word that someone gives to you to let you know that the divine conspirator is moving on your behalf. But I want you to know that he's still here. Hallelujah. He's behind the scene. He's in front of the scene. He's 
under the scene. He's around the scene. He's over the scene. He's in the scene, orchestrating and coordinating. Hallelujah, our lives. And I personally have encountered many Hamans in my life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I've encountered many Hamans in my life. Hamans that have told me that I'm never going to be anything. You're going to be just like your mama. You're going to be just like your daddy. You ain't never going to amount to nothing. You ain't got no education. And I know I'm not being grammatically correct, but that's okay. Because that's how it comes at you. It comes just like that. It comes to tear you down just like that. It comes to get into your spirit and tear you down and tell you that there is no divine conspirator at work for you but that's a lie from the pit of hell hallelujah we have a divine conspirator that's working on our behalf he was always with me he never let me go when I was born as a premature child he held me in the cradle of his hands hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah it's all good it's all good it's all good and it's all God hallelujah thank you Jesus hallelujah thank you Jesus he was with me every step of the way he was with me every step of the way he had a plan and a purpose for my life because he knew today that I would be standing here before you telling you that there was a divine conspirator working on your behalf. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, no matter what they say about you, no matter what they do, yes, you've lost your job. No, you don't have any money. Oh my goodness, you've got cancer. There is a divine conspirator who is here to heal, who is here to deliver, who is here to set free, who is here to make your way straight. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. There's a divine conspirator working on your behalf. There's a divine conspirator who's in the middle of the scene who's behind you, who's under you, who's around you, who's in you. The power of the Holy Spirit is moving in this place, and he's moving in you. There is a divine conspirator, and he's on your side. He promises that he will make a table before you in the presence of your enemies. Hallelujah. Haman may not have been able to see everything that God did for Mordecai, but there was a table set. And I'm sure there were some other people that were with Haman who were able to see what the divine conspirator did. He said that he'll even make them your footstool. Hallelujah. He'll allow you to climb up on their back to get you to where you need to go. You'll stand on their shoulders. They may not like it, but you'll stand on their shoulders to get where God wants you to go. Hallelujah. He has promised that the Hamans that you see today, you will never, ever, ever see again. That's the promise. The same God who is behind the scene, in front of the scene, under the scene, around the scene, over the scene, in the scene, is orchestrating and coordinating. And he has promised that he will never leave you. And he has promised that he will never <laughs> forsake you. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's going to get us. He's going to get us. He's going to get us to that expected end. Amen. Won't you trust him? Won't you trust him? He has a plan. And he has a purpose. So don't look at what you've went through or what you've gone through or what you're going through. 
and tap out. Don't tap out. Stay the course. Grab hold and tell him I won't let go until you bless me. I know you've got a blessing for me. I know you've got healing for my soul. I know, I know because I'm still here. So I know, hallelujah. And the divine conspirator just doesn't want to meet with us down here. He wants to meet with us up there. <laughs> hallelujah. So don't let the evil conspirator get you all confused and all wrapped up and all tied up with what you see down here. This is not our home. This ain't our home. So it doesn't matter. Pastor said, just rejoice. Just rejoice. Hallelujah. Why? Because you're going home to be with the divine conspirator. That's your home. That's our home. That's where we'll have peace and joy overflowing. Not that he doesn't want us to have it here because he does. He honestly does. But this isn't permanent. This is going to pass away. The divine conspirator is concerned about our heart. The divine conspirator is concerned about our relationship with him. Not anybody else. Haman had to do what he did. He had to. Judas had to do what he did. He had to. Joseph's brothers had to do what they did. They had to. They had to. But it was all a setup to get them to where they needed to go, where God wanted them to go, for God's will to be done in them, for God's will to be done in us. You have a divine conspirator, and that's God. Won't you try it? Let him guide you. God bless you. Jesus, you're the center.